Welcome to the Create a Push, an intimate and diverse artist interview series. Here, artists and makers of all kinds share tips, advice, knowledge, and inspiration that you can learn from. I'm your host, Sherry O'Neill, a photographer, artist, writer, and educator. This series is a part of the Learn and Create platform to help artists further their education in creativity, art, and business. Today we have John Petrie, who is a sculptor. Tell me a little bit about what you do, then give us a little background about your path. I am a sculptor. I work with mixed media in sculpture work, copper, steel, and aluminum, a lot of vintage materials, a lot of repurposed industrial materials. The last 12 years, I've become pretty well known nationally for my dresses. So I'm represented by 10 galleries around the country. I have work in private, corporate, and public collections throughout the United States. And it's better than a real job. And it's a <laughs> career change for me. I grew up in Southern California, an only child, uh, Brooks Institute. I have a degree in design and a degree in commercial photography. Moved to Orlando, Florida, opened a studio down there in the early 80s and specialized in food and liquor advertising, as well as sports celebrity endorsement work in golf and baseball, because a lot of golfers live in Florida and spring training. Tell me a little bit about your childhood growing up. I was born in San Diego. I was adopted. We moved inland from San Diego to a town called Hemet. It's near Palm Springs. My dad was a contractor. He did underground new subdivision work. My mom was a beautician. She owned beauty salons. Her parents owned beauty salons. So she grew up in that. With my dress series work, one of the initial things that made it happen when I left my old world as a photographer was fond memories of your past. So I started working originally in something I knew, the 60s and 70s, in style. When you work in something for many, many years, you get pretty good at it. You've got to create a certain look for something. And, and so you become very aware of it. So I started out in an era that I grew up in, and it's expanded from medieval era in reference to ultra contemporary and everything in between. When Disney did the animated film Brave, I was commissioned to do the lead character, a dress of hers, which is about six and a half feet tall. I was working from very secretive drawings that they sent to me because they were still in production to create this sculpture to go to LA for the premiere of the movie. I see work even on Instagram. I follow some fashion designers because I like to see what they do with fabric, which is easy to me mentally. I want to do it in metal. You know, I want to take a material that is rigid, hard, and make it flow and have shape and color and movement. I'm a visual learner. Show me something or I can read something. If I visually see it, it makes total sense. So I'm constantly looking at visuals because that's what I was. I was a photographer creating periods in time, creating things to influence you to buy my clients' products. I'm constantly looking at stuff and doing screenshots of things just to keep. And I don't really use the screenshots as visual reference. The process of doing it kind of makes it stay in my brain. And then I eventually will resurrect. It. How often do you create what you want to create versus what someone else wants you to create? I do a lot of commission work. I will walk them through the process of creating something that speaks to them. I want them to walk by that piece in their home and smile because it triggers a memory for them, a visual from their youth. If I don't think the colors work or the suggestions the client makes, I will tell them because if I create something that I don't like, they won't like it. I don't like clients who are unhappy. I will work with the client to come up with something that gets the point that they want, but also does something that they will live with and walk by and smile and be very happy and tell their friends. You want that when you do what I do. Having a lot of galleries around the country, I have to create a lot of work and we have to rotate work inventory from gallery to gallery, depending on some cities sell certain types of things more than others. I talk to my gallery owners all the time about what's the hot colors? What are the designers working with in that city? So I listen to them a lot. Try to watch color trends and style trends. I have to be aware of that because I do this because it's fun. I am a maker. I love what I do, but it has to make money. The hardest thing for me as an artist is I want to mess with something new. And the first thing that comes into my head is, will it sell? 
And that's one of the worst things as a pure artist to do. I find the balance. No matter what, it's fun. Doing something, anything long enough in any kind of profession, I've gotten to where if I see something, can I use that? I will have maybe 100,000 bottle caps in the case lot sitting in the warehouse that have to be prepared for what I do. Because I take the bottle caps, they have to have a hole drilled in them in a specific spot. They have to go through a media tumbler, which takes the gloss off of them so I can repaint them. They have to be flattened and then they can be used. So there's a lot of steps sometimes in the prep of a material. Once I sit down and start assembly, it goes pretty fast. Prepping a material, layering colors of paint through stencils and sanding through those layers can take the most time. Sometimes I'll go to materials I know that I have and I can manipulate those color-wise or whatever. My studio space is 4,000 square feet with 19 foot ceilings. I have pallet racks to store stuff. I have a raised deck to store my really large finished pieces on. It's the big typical metal free span building. We have in the front part of it is our residence. My studio is literally out my office door on the backside. So I'm going from in the house to the studio. But I have a lot of hand tools. I have every kind of welder. Uh, I do have a shear, a smaller shear, because I work a lot with lighter weight aluminum and copper and steel that can be cut on the smaller shear. Because I have to be able to manipulate the shape of a piece of metal. I have a lot of different types of material cutting tools from typical hand shears to a lightweight plate shear, the plasma cutter, the MIG welder, the TIG welder, all that kind of stuff. I've got a 20 ton embossing press because I emboss metal to use in my work. Every kind of nail gun, the big giant 150 gallon size compressor down Mm. to the 10 gallon compressor, a paint booth, a small fabricated built paint booth because paint booths are very expensive to buy. So I made one, you know, and then I have a forklift. Every boy needs a forklift. Uh, (laughs) Even if you just have to take the trash cans to the curb, I'm always in search of materials. As a photographer, back before the digital realm, you were constantly chasing business. When I made the transition, it was really easy because I was able to use those skill set that I had learned as a photographer and just carry it over. That transition wasn't hard for me. I never quit chasing business. Just Mm -hmm. like when I was a photographer, never, no matter how much money you're making or how busy you are, never quit chasing business. Hey guys, thanks for listening. I hope you're enjoying the creative push. These artist interviews are a labor of love, but it sure would help if you'd consider supporting this podcast with a small monthly donation to help sustain the work and time it takes for me to produce future episodes. You can click the support button or you can click the link below in the show notes. Any support is greatly appreciated and you can cancel at any time. Either way, I'm glad to have you here. Please subscribe and share. Now let's get back to the show. What is creativity to you? Can you define that in your own terms? Everybody has creativity in them. I firmly believe this because I constantly have people come up and say, oh, you're so creative. I have no creativity in me. I stop them dead in their tracks. And I say, yes, you do. What you have is fear. If you have the means to try something, you don't have to have the fear of judgment when you're done with it. If you aren't happy with it, go out in the backyard pour lighter fluid on it, light it on fire and dance around it naked. The process from doing it, actually trying it, whatever it was when it was done, that's the most important first step in being a creative human being. Everybody is creative. Creativity has to be fostered. Everybody has some sort of creativity in them. You just have to be willing to make mistakes and find your path. You can go to school. I know that what I do now I couldn't have done in my 20s because I was a different person. If I wouldn't have gone through 24, 25 years of being an advertising photographer, I would not be the artist I am today Mm because I needed life experience to draw on. That's been one of the most important things to me. I try to mentor young artists from time to time. I have teachers come and talk to me at events about, you know, they're trying to get their students to think 
outside, I hate the term outside the box <laughs> uh, about material use and everything. And they'll mm-hmm. see what I do and they'll go, oh, I love how you use materials. What do you do when you get stuck? On- uh, I race motorcycles. I go up on weekdays because there's nobody there but me. I have a 10 mile loop with water crossings, elevation changes and rocks. I ride fast because I know there's nobody up there but me on the trails. And yes, I have GPS so Peggy can find me. What it does, you have to totally concentrate on that or your behind's going to be on the ground and you can get hurt seriously. I'm concentrating on that. I don't think about what I do. And so that's my getaway. When you live in the building you work in, it's really easy to go out and move in the studio and work. I'm also a big TV watcher, drives my wife crazy. I'm a big science fiction fan. How did they do that effect? You know, it goes back to my film days. The new series, which is this Hunter series, which we as a society, not just in America, but worldwide, are literally destroying this planet through pollution. What I did is I created a series of new pieces that deal with a situation where human-animal hybrids come to be and become the dominant force of reclaiming this planet before there's nothing left of it. They are very science fiction oriented. They are human figures, animalistic characteristics, heads, antlers. They are very aggressive in style. The work is very textural. They have masks and respirators on. Do you have Um, any odd or unusual collections? We have, Peggy and I both have very similar tastes and she's a keeper of small stuff. We have a lot of American folk art coupled with a lot of contemporary artists who most of them are friends of ours. I do collecting motorcycles. I currently own five, three are vintage racing motorcycles, a modern street bike and a modern race bike. I only collect things currently that I can use in my work. What what advice would you give to an upcoming person wanting to study either photography or sculpture? There is so much online now, which I don't follow at all, so I don't know anything about it. But you can learn a lot from that. But I don't know if you have the one-on-one with a brutal instructor, like I had at Brooks, to really critique the daylights out of it. From the sculptural or fine art standpoint, there's a lot of choice out there of schools. My biggest pet peeve is they don't teach you how to make a living. And creating work that people will buy. You can't survive off of grants and residency. You can try to get internships as a young artist. If you want to spend a little extra money while you're in school, take as much business as you possibly can. If you spend a hundred hours creating a painting and you can, you sell it for $500. Wow. That's a lot of money. You just made five bucks an hour. Everybody comes up with a formula eventually with experience for this size. I have X dollars per square inch, but keeping track of how much time as even as a young artist, even Mm -hmm. when you're experimenting, have some sort of idea how much skin you have in the game and then constantly look for opportunity. You have to be able to take rejection. You have to get a really thick skin. I think every young artist should at some point do outdoor art festivals. You learn a lot. And if you have the opportunity to go to them in more than one town or city, do it. Mm -hmm. And walk around from the mindset of a buyer, not as an artist. Because those artists that are there, they're making their living doing that. You can learn a lot from what they're selling. Look Mm -hmm. at the ones that are busy. Look at the type of work that's selling. Customers are brutal. But you get a thick skin, and that's a really good thing. So how can people find your work? It's www.johnpetrie.com. My website is there. It lists work that I've done in the past. It has an available work section of what is in inventory in the studio and how to get contact with all the galleries that handle my work around the country. So there may be a gallery near you. Well, thanks, John. This has been a great interview. I appreciate your time. Thank you. It's good to see you. Thank you so much for listening. As always, my intention is to offer inspiration that excites you to want to get out there and create something amazing. Be sure to check out some of the other episodes. There's more information below in the show notes, including links to other great stories, tips, and resources. Drop me a message or comment at any time, and I hope that you'll sign up to be a part of this creative tribe.